it only considers cash flow up to payback and any cash flows beyond that point are ignored. Well, hold on a moment. That is the issue. It doesn't mean we, we can't get a, a measure of return. And of course, this means that when we look at a particular project, whether it is a relatively good or pro bad project in terms of overall performance is something beyond this technique. And of course, there is no objective measure of what is an acceptable payback period. Uh, to give you an idea, when I had a proper job many years ago, uh, payback for a piece of industrial equipment would be, well, we would normally expect less than three years. Something less tangible, maybe less than two years. And something of more infrastructural perspective, we would accept a longer payback period. So highly subjective. OK. Now, before we leave payback, let's just look at something very simple that may arise. And I just don't want this trick to get away from you. You see, what happens if we have equal cash flows each year? What we will learn to call later on an annuity. If we have equal cash flows each year, like this example, what we can do is calculate payback far more quickly because all we have to do is to take the initial investment and divide through by the cash flow per annum. Taking advantage of the fact that the cash flows are a constant. So if you wish, what have we got here? 60,000 is the initial investment, 25,000 is the cash flow each year. What we end up with is 2.4 years. Very simple stuff. Is that good? Well, of course we don't know unless we are given some form of target. So, is payback difficult? I think we can all appreciate it's not too difficult. But of course, what your examiner tends to do here is not just get you to calculate it, but also get you to comment on the relative use, usefulness of payback. Be ready for those, if you wish, advantage and disadvantage type questions. They come in a number of shapes and forms, and your examiner has used them a number of times to establish your knowledge. Right, moving on. Now we look at something called ROCE. Now the first thing I'd like to point out about ROCE is this. This is also known as ARR, or Accounting Rate of Return. And I'm not quite sure why the examiner talks about it in the form of ROCE, because to me that is possibly confusing because it is the same term as used in financial accounting with regard to a profitability measure. Now, all I would like to highlight is this. What we're interested in is the investment appraisal measure. And therefore, when we calculate our OCE, it is over the life of the project, not just one year. It relates to the future. Yes, we're considering whether or not we want to take this project in the future rather than the past. And the basis is to make that decision. Now, based on that, what we have is a formula. I call it a formula. Please notice this is not given to you by the examiner. You must learn this. So, we want the estimated average annual profit divided through by the average investment. Now, before we go anywhere with this, how do we get profit? Well, of course, if you asked a financial accountant that, the conversation would go on, or should I say the monologue, would go on for many hours. But in simple terms, which is what we need at F9, profit is simply this. It's going to be our trading cash flow, you know, our day-to-day -day cash flow, minus depreciation. And please remember this relationship. 
Because when it comes to calculating ROC in exam conditions, what you're going to have is more than likely you will already have your trading cash flows somewhere else in the question. And what you want to do is just to adjust from that figure into the profit figure that we need. Well, OK. What I've got here is a little pro forma. Again, just to help us. You obviously didn't need to write this one up. Um, let's just take ourselves back to the question and see what's what. So, I want to know total profit. And my thoughts are, is that I can add together all the cash flows to get it for the whole period. So what have we got there? 50 plus 40 plus 30 plus 25 plus 25? Is that 165? So we've got our total cash flow. Now, what do we say? To get profit, we can take our total cash flow and divide through by the total depreciation. So looking at the information here, couldn't we say that the total depreciation is going to be the difference between the initial value and the residual value? Couldn't we say 100 minus 5, total depreciation is 95? OK, so if we've got those sort of bits and pieces, our total cash flow was 165. I suppose everything is in thousands. Depreciation, 95. Therefore, total profit, 70. And if you look back at the question, we had five years. So we divide by five and you get 14. Now, now we want the average investment. And the average investment is where we take the initial investment, 100, plus the residual value. Remember, we add them together because we're saying that the, the investment's falling from 100 at the beginning to 5,000 at the end. Yes? And so the average is going to be sort of somewhere halfway in between. So we add them together and divide by 2 a simple average, and we get an average investment of 52.5. Therefore, your ARR is going to equal 14 divided through by 52.5, and that comes to something like 26.67, something like that. And that is your ARR. So, relatively simple... But I will say that this is being asked on a regular basis. Advantages. Easy to understand, I hope. Easy to calculate, I hope. Considers the impact on the company's financial statement. That's an interesting point. Remember, the company is very interested on what's going to happen to its financial statements going forward. And as such, this will give us some indication of what that investment will do to future financial statements. Ah, it links project attractiveness to the manner in which it's reported to shareholders. And of course, it is some measure of return. So these are the sort of advantages we may have. Disadvantages? Hmm. It fails to take account of the project life or the timing of cash flows and the time value of money. Three points in one here. Now, we don't know what time value of money is just yet. Don't worry about that. But in simple terms, it doesn't consider whether the project life is short or long, which may have a bearing on whether we want to do it. And it doesn't consider whether... We get the cash flow, or pardon me, profits of the early years or in the latter years, which again would have a key bearing on whether we would want to do the project. Ah, it uses accounting profit, therefore it's open to accounting convention. Highly subjective. So you could possibly manipulate the data here in a manner which you would not be able to do with, say, payback, as we talked about before. There's no definite invest investment signal. Again, it's subjective. We had that return, but is that good or bad? And the answer is we do not know. Uh, it doesn't give an idea of absolute gain, something we discuss about in a moment. 
and it's susceptible to manipulation, as we said above. So, a few advantages and a few disadvantages. I would strongly advise that when you get to the exam, you start thinking very carefully about what the examiner is asking you in this area, because you can score some easy marks by some relatively basic observations. In summary, you have considered non-discounted cash flow methods of investment appraisal. There are two basic methods, payback and ROCE. This is a minor exam topic. It's not going to come up for a lot of marks. Having said that, it is examinable regularly. We would expect one or other or both to come up, maybe every other sitting. And typical mark allocation, relatively difficult to pick out here, but anywhere from two marks up to eight marks in my view.